Roughly 20% of Americans have a sleep disorder and 35% don't get the recommended seven hours of sleep a night, even though the average American got nine hours of sleep per night just 100 years ago. Since 1985, the percentage of adults getting less than six hours of sleep per night has increased 35%. An astonishing 97% of teenagers do not get enough sleep, and 70% of college students don't get enough sleep. Annually, we incur health care costs of over $400 billion related to sleep deprivation. This is really bad because the body has very important tasks to accomplish while we are asleep. Our brain makes decisions. It creates and consolidates memories. It makes creative connections and clears toxins out of our brain. The brain also learns and remembers how to perform physical skills like golfing, dancing, yoga. The immune system also gets activated while we sleep. T cells go into action and fight off viruses and infection. Sleep deprivation increases the release of inflammatory cytokines and long-term lack of sleep increases your risk of obesity, diabetes, and heart and blood vessel disease. Molly McLaughlin is our guest today, and she is the creator of Sleep is a Skill, a company that optimizes how people sleep through a unique blend of technology, accountability, and behavioral change. The company was born because Molly herself struggled to sleep. A lifetime of poor sleep habits culminating, it culminated in a very challenging bout with insomnia for months on end. She has a background in psychology and human behavior, and she became fascinated and went straight down a rabbit hole of how do you solve sleep problems without using sleep aids. She became fascinated with chronobiology and by extension, its practical applications for how we restore a state of homeostasis, not only with sleep, but with life in general. Knowing the difference between a life with and without sleep, she has now dedicated her life to sharing the forgotten skill of sleeping. Welcome to The Lindsay Elmore Show, a podcast that helps you find fulfillment amidst chaos. On this show, I interview thought leaders, doctors, creatives, spiritual gurus, and game changers who inspire you to pursue your dreams, overcome obstacles, and leave your mark. Welcome to the Lindsay Elmore Show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate that. And that was a real powerful introduction to this topic. So that was really well done. Well, I have to say, I personally struggled with insomnia back when I was in pharmacy school. I did not fully understand how brain activating games right at bedtime can make such a difference. And after a month of not sleeping through the night, I I genuinely thought I was going to die. I really did. And so start out by just telling us how can the time we eat, the temperature of our room, the sun, the darkness, what we do around the time of bedtime impact our sleep and our overall health? Absolutely. So number one, I feel for you um, completely can relate and empathize with that period of of your life. And that's similar to um, my experience. And it ended up being, you know, fully what took me into this direction with creating this company, Sleep is a Skill. Um, So I'm very grounded in the difference that that can make. And to answer your question, um, all of those things basically point to they're, they're in the realm of how to strengthen our circadian rhythm. And so what we're looking to do, so, you know, to back it up, basically our circadian rhythm, um, as humans, we operate on a largely 24 hour, uh, cycle. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's something that we've been a part of for thousands of years. And this is really how humans were designed to function. And yet what we've seen is that post Edison, um, you know, post the ability to extend our days in kind of an artificial manner um, that is really foreign to how we used to, you know, interact with the world around us for thousands of years of hunter gatherers. Um, now that we've been able to extend things, we've found that our circadian rhythm, since it is dynamic, has 
really shifted and gone a little bit off course of the strength of the circadian rhythm um, for the many of us, particularly in these Western societies, um, is is struggling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so what are the things that we can do to strengthen our circadian rhythm? Um, so number one, the largest or the, uh, the most impactful, uh, outside external cue is light. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that we want to get really tuned into. And you might have heard of this. So say when, um, you're dealing with jet lag and you know, you're, you're struggling with, with this problem, you maybe do a quick Google. And one of the things that they'll mention is to, uh, get connected to like get outside, get some sunlight, right? So they'll, they'll mention that in your new environment and get on the new time zone that you're in. Um, so we, that makes perfect sense when we're traveling, but we forget the power of that in our own day-to-day -day life. And so often what we're experiencing is something called social jet lag, which takes us way off of our normal, um, you know, rhythms. And so we're experiencing unbeknownst to us, what some of the symptomology is for jet lag, just because of the way we were handling and scheduling our days. Okay. So um, tell us, tell us what social jet lag even is. What does that mean? Yeah. So basically it's really interesting. Um, so case in point, five days a week, you go to bed largely around the same time and you know, you got your little schedule and your thing and then whatever the weekend comes Thursday, Friday, and suddenly you find yourself, Oh, you got an event, you got a wedding, you got a thing. And suddenly you're going to bed now, three, four hours later than your normal time. So we forget that that is um, really the equivalent of having traveled across into multiple different time zones and then not giving it its due diligence to how to bring things back. And what you're also dealing with is something called metabolic jet lag because now your meal timing has skewed in a way that your body is uh, confused as to what time it is, which is for me, I think a fascinating concept that our body is constantly looking to stay on this uh, routine schedule and it's trying to work with you, which is amazing because it's dynamic. And we see that again on, say, if you go from New York to Hong Kong, and if we were to not be dynamic and if your body wasn't able to adjust, that would be really a problem. You know, if you're trying, you're suddenly just, you're de like doomed to be on your own time zone for the entire time you're there, that would be problematic, but it's not that way. It can adjust, but it, it takes time. Um, and it can be a real hit to your, um, to your physiology. Right. So, yep, go ahead. Well, and so, and we also see, so you mentioned metabolism. Yeah. So why is it that lack of sleep impacts diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity? Because these are the top, some of the top killers of humans these days. How does sleep deprivation actually make our metabolism different. So how does sleep deprivation increase the risk of cardiovascular diseases? What's really interesting is that um, it helps to go back to look at the core, what we understand right now to be the core functioning of why we sleep. And this has been kind of this um, ongoing debate and question. Uh, and so right now there's still a lot of unknowns, but what we do understand is that one of the things that your body is doing while you are sleeping is that it's going through a series of processes um, in different times of your sleep architecture. So within slow wave sleep, that's some of the period that we're going through some of this repair period. And so it's particularly important for brain functioning, um, but it's also tending to kind of a cellular cleanup that is crucial to go through each day. And that is the reason why if we are not going through that, and so as it relates to cardiovascular health, as it relates to brain health, as it you know relates to digestive health, I mean, it's really looking to go through and kind of, you know, it's it's the janitorial process for your body. Yeah. And if, and right, because when we think about it in just such more simplistic terms, it can almost be an easier thing. Like, you know, say if you worked in a nine to five and the magic of when you leave at five o'clock and you come back the next day and everything was, you know, a mess or whatever. And it's, ah, uh, the garbage bags are put back in. Everything's cleaned up. It's vacuumed. And there's a system, right? The same thing applies to your body. And the problem that we're finding is that as uh, our lives are dynamic and there's so much, you know, um, demands and so much opportunity to, you know, kind of go down the rabbit holes of different 
things, whether it's smoke, our phones, our laptops, Netflix, all the things. Um, and we joke about this, but the, the impact is real because what we see is that when we get more inconsistent with our sleep, the architecture that we were pointing to um, often throws itself off course. And so what you're finding is that then that can impact things like that slow wave sleep, which really comes in the first stage of your, of your night. And if you are going to bed at different times, that social jet lag that we were talking about, there are times where then you just, you skip a lot of that opportunity and then it puts you into REM sleep um, or light sleep. And then, so that crucial time of cleanup, you're not getting to have that experience in the same way that you could if you had this count onable window mm -hmm. and it seems simple and yet it's when you get the why it can change everything and so it's not just metabolic disorders that can develop we also see neurodegenerative disorders um, Parkinson uh, Parkinsonianism and Alzheimer's disease have been linked to sleep deprivation so why is sleep deprivation almost toxic and changing the structure yeah. of our brain Oh, so this one has gotten a lot of press more recently in recent years, um, you know, and it's actually something that um, I believe is part of the reason why there's um, what I'm almost calling like a sleep renaissance of that there's more and more people. I mean, doesn't it feel like you've been hearing about sleep a bit more? You know, you open up your phone and what there's articles, right? People are starting to talk about it, one, because it's a problem to your point of what you spoke to in the beginning of this, um, and two, because when we get clear of that link up between particularly these neurodegenerative diseases, because now, you know, people are hesitant to make um, a sweeping claim like, you know, sleep deprivation causes X. However, um, based on some pretty conclusive studies that we do have, now we found like a clear link. Um, and it's a time where now people are starting to take seriously the sleep deprivation. So how does that relate to um, the health of our brain? goes back to that janitorial process. And what we've discovered is something called glymphatic drainage. And, you know, we might've heard of lymphatic drainage, yeah. um, right? So, but this so is, that's- But this is glymphatic with the, yes. with the G. With the G, exactly. Yes. So glymphatic is actually um, a process that it cleans out your brain, again, in that same janitorial way. So your brain during that slow wave sleep actually gets smaller. It kind of, it shrinks down a bit to allow for this fluid to come through and wash out that waste product that, you know, the kind of the toxic that we were talking, the toxins that we were discussing. But not even just, out. not even just toxins, just metabolic byproducts, byproducts that exactly. you just don't need anymore you do not, in your brain. Right. And not only do you not need them, what happens is if that process doesn't fulfill, if it's not fulfilled on, uh, what we see is this uh, kind of calcification, this plaque, um, which is known as amyloid beta plaque. And if you compare, you know, brain scans of someone that is chronically sleep deprived and someone with late stage Alzheimer's, what you'll see is a real link up that is surprising. Um, and what it's looking to is that similarity of those plaques and the fact that there has not been the reliable process to you know, bring those out of the body each day, right? So there's a buildup, um, you know, effect when we have this as a chronic situation, which is what we're seeing for so many more people. Um, and so you can see over time, this cognitive decline from something that really is behaviorally preventable. Yeah, absolutely. And we also know that medicines that treat sleep um, don't really work that well. You know, the over-the-counter yes. medicines are typically first-generation antihistamines that have not really been shown to improve sleep latency. Everyone from the American Pediatrics Association to the American Geriatrics Association recommends against the use of yes. over-the-counter sleep medicines, especially long-term. And then we also know from our sedative hypnotics like Zolpidem, they destroy your body's ability yes. to go into deep sleep. And so you wake up still feeling tired and exhausted. So yeah. I was fascinated back when I was struggling with um, back when I was struggling with insomnia. I went to the acupuncturist and she explained to me that the concepts of how to treat insomnia are completely different in Eastern medicine versus Western medicine. In Western medicine, it becomes about like force yourself to stay awake all day, take your, take your drugs at night. Um, in, in Chinese medicine, 
the reason that we have insomnia is exactly what you were saying. We have a lot of time, thanks to Thomas Edison, where yeah. the sun is down, but we are still exposed to light and we are staying awake for a long time while it is dark outside. But we don't have periods during the day where we sleep. And so what are some of the, you say that your system is a blend of technology, accountability, and behavioral changes. So what have you learned about how to heal sleep disorders without the use of the medications? Mm. So well said, um, and you really uh, enrich this topic because to your point, there's so many different ways of approaching this problem. Um, and that was kind of part of the reason why I created this company because um, I'm an obsessive personality. That's partly what got me into the realm of insomnia, you know, cause I was just, you know, really had burned the candle at both ends, um, was, you know, dealing with the, the same problems that so many people that now come to me, that's what I was having the problem of not being able to turn my brain off, right? Like just that rumination, so much anticipatory anxiety. Um, and it was really problematic. And what was um, what was difficult was when I would then try to learn more and more and more, there would be so many schools of thought. Um, and to your point, there was a very clear divide between East and West. Um, and I, I went down that road of, I went to the doctors and, you know, cause I was traveling at the time and I was just at my wits end and didn't know what to do. And they gave me, this was in Croatia at the time I was traveling internationally and they gave me their version of Ambien. And it was this moment for me of no, like <laughs> this yeah. can't be my future. Right. Um, so to your point, there's many different ways of addressing this. And so what I've um, basic, so with sleep as a skill, our commitment is this concept that now in our modern day society, sleep has now become a skill set. And again, to your point, pre-Edison, this would sound really ridiculous in yeah. a lot of ways, you know, like this would just be a real hard sell. And yet I believe it with every fiber of my bone in our modern day, you know, um, ecology. So basically what I've put together is it's a whole system around something called circadian rhythm entrainment. Mm -hmm. And so for circadian rhythm entrainment, um, what you're doing is taking uh, getting connected to what they call time givers. And these time givers are all the things that externally impact our relationship to our chronobiology, which is the science of time. So all we're doing is put, going down kind of the totem pole of what will make the largest difference in our um, in our body's strength of our circadian rhythm. So we spoke or uh, we kind of touched on that light is one of the top, right? You know, and with all of these things, by the way, it's an umbrella of consistency. So, you know, anything that we do here, it's looking to how can we make this as consistent as possible seven days a week. So the top is this relationship to light. And then of course, connected with light is um, getting a relationship with darkness in a way that many of us are missing. You know, we're kind of in this dark deprived society where many of us are not really experiencing true darkness um, and something akin to it post sunset. So you're getting connected to those. And then one of the next part on the rung for circadian rhythm strength is temperature. So if we think about the fact that in our modern day society, many of us are pretty much for all intents and purposes, like closest, more close to zoo animals than we are to our native ways of living, right? Because uh, some of the stats are around spending around 90% of our days inside, at least for many of us. Um, so if that's the case, then we need to then be responsible for our environment in a way that can mimic our outdoor um, connections as much as we can. So temperature is one that you can do that will be um, akin to circadian uh, timing. So if you if you think back to how things were, when you would wake up with the sun, the sun would of course heat the environment around you and then the temperature would go up and that would be yet another cue. Um, so as you're rising, that's why during REM sleep, your temperature is going up a little bit. Um, and it's all of this is acting to tell your body it's time to, you know, it's, it's time for cortisol to be produced. Um, this is all, you know, part of this great design. So you raise the temperature in your environment and then you know you do all the active things that we're meant to do to keep our body the body temperature higher um and then that's also when we get the max amount of that sunlight which is also going to heat us up um but that also involves meal timing so that's also another thing that will raise our bodily temperature 
Um, it's surprisingly, you know, dynamic and taxing system to do when the body is to digest. Um, so you get connected to meal timing in a way that's, you know, distinct from how many people are relating to it. Um, so it's also movement timing and also thought timing. Surprisingly, thoughts um, heat up our body in a way that we forget. There's actually gadgets on the market. I have a podcast interview with the creator of a company that literally just cools down your prefrontal cortex um, for people that are over, you know, active. Um, and they've done a lot of clinical studies on this. And um, it speaks to the power of what's happening even internally and how that can heat up our body, which is much more of an Eastern philosophy too, but now getting some science behind it. Uh, so those are some of the ways that we bring things into having this um, system. And then we also bring in the technology. So I have just about every client wear something called the Aura Ring, which is O-U-R-A. And that's um, a sleep specific tracker that will look at your body temperature, your respiratory rate. Um, it will bring in this connection to your heart rate and your heart rate variability, uh, your sleep time duration. You know, sleep stages are a little bit harder unless you have EEG readout, um, but it does give you a nice kind of automated sleep diary. Um, so doing that and then along with the accountability aspect that you mentioned, uh, we bring in sleep bots. So then we do a daily check-in of how your sleep went and then preparing you for the day around the circadian rhythm entrainment concept. Yeah, and you know, a study just came out not too long ago that shows what you were saying that when you change temperatures and you intentionally sleep where it's really, really cold, yes. we can actually extend life. And so simply manipulating all of the temperatures it might not be something anyone has ever thought of, but I know I personally sleep better when it's cold. I intentionally have sheets that are very, very breathable and are out, help to cool down the body as we sleep. And so what are, we, sleep deprivation is at an absolute all time high. What do you say to that stressed out mom who, you know, her kids are finally sleeping through the night, but she's still up doing the projects and, and baking the cookies and trying to be Wonder Woman. And it's just like, you know what? Six hours is fine for me. What do you do to change behaviors? Yeah. So it's a, such a good point um, because so many of us, you know, it's kind of like that old saying of fish to water, you know, the fish doesn't even realize it's in water. Um, it's like that for many of us because we're so sleep deprived, we kind of just think that that's how life is. Um, and you know, this, the symptoms of what, you know, if we were to look back in hindsight, that seem to be sleep deprivation, we just think is, you know, who we are. It's part of our personality. Oh, I'm forgetful. I'm this, uh, oh, I'm so tired, whatever, all those things. Right. Um, so one it's, uh, kind of re educating and coming back from this uh, concept that sleep is a skill. So we really have to start that we're at ground zero for even for the people that say, oh, I sleep fine. Oh, not a problem. Um, you know, so there's many things as we've gotten into some of the weeds on some of these topics that people are not even aware of that can be impacting their sleep, that they to come at it from zero from a student perspective, then there's still room to then uh, learn what there is to learn. So for that stressed out mom, um, I'm making the argument that's actually more controversial that, uh, you know, on the quest for health and wellness, often that super mom wants to be presumably healthy and, you know, vibrant and, and all those things. Right. Um, so I'm making the argument that the, the, in that journey for wellness, that sleep has been this forgotten piece of the puzzle. Um, and I'm actually advocating that it's number one above, um, you know, above, uh, nutrition above uh, exercise, and and not to say by any means that those are not super important, and they're all part of this puzzle, and actually they will aid in getting great sleep, all of those things. Um, however, I'm making the argument that it is infinitely more challenging to even be connected to those if your sleep is out of whack. Um, you know, because obviously, uh, you know, clearly your knowledge is very vast on this area, which is incredible. Um, and so I'm sure you're already connected to around all of these uh, hormonal changes that happen around our, you know, uh, metabolism when we're not sleeping. So, you know, as far as even just on that quest to, you know, maintain, uh, you know, just a strong and fit body that can get thrown out the window when we are not sleeping in the way that we could because leptin and ghrelin get all 
crazed, right? And then and with leptin and ghrelin get all crazed, we get fat. <laughs> yes, and we basically. Eat, and we eat all the time without ever being full. We just get fat. That's what yes. leptin and ghrelin do for us. <laughs> exactly. And then it makes it so much more challenging to fulfill on these goals of, you know, New Year's comes along and we say, oh my God, okay, great. This is the year I'm going to lose 10 pounds. I'm going to you know, work out all these things, you're it, by not tending to sleep first, you're really, you know, shooting yourself in the foot to fulfill on those other goals anyway. So prioritizing this from that new lens, um, I think can breathe new life into all of our goals for health and well-being. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, it seems crazy that we have to teach people I know. to sleep because yeah. When you think about evolutionary biology, if sleep was not critically important for us, we wouldn't do it. We yes. wouldn't spend. It would have been cut. Yeah. Yeah. It would have gotten cut off. We wouldn't spend a third of our lives sleeping if we did not need it so much. So yeah. before I let you go, let's do some lightning round questions. Are you ready? Let's do it. What is your number one strength? Ah, uh, number one strength is uh, probably also my number one weakness, but they go together is my obsessive nature. I will just stick with a problem until it is solved. So, yeah. yeah. I thought you were going to say sleep. That was your number <laughs> one strength. You do it well it's every led single into day. <laughs> oh, my God. It's the number one thing I talk about all day. So, yeah. What do you struggle with the most aside from those obsessions? Well, probably then that obsessiveness. So, you know, with that, it's having to teach myself so for one, I'm, I'm going on an um, information diet because I could happily research until I'm 87 years old and be as happy as a clam. And yet really shifting over to, you know, moving into the production and output um, versus consumption. So that's really an area for me right now. Yeah, I know. Sometimes it's so nice just to stay off social media yeah. and like not watch the news for a minute. Yep. And it really just puts so much less stress in yes. your life. Um, yeah. If you could turn back the clock and give a piece of advice to your younger self, what would it be? So that's such a good question. Um, you know, so for me, one of the hardest periods of my life was actually around this time of sleep. That's why it's made such a difference. Um, and I've dedicated my whole life to it now. And so I want to say that I would go back and help that person during that time. However, um, I'm also clear that it, by going through that, it ended up being one of the best things that could have happened to me because now my commitment to my health and well-being and really shifted my entire life around what was important. Um, so I guess if I were to say anything, just, you know, trust the process, mm. um, and kind of just allow yourself to let go in mm -hmm. those moments. But, um, it almost seemed like I had to go through it. <laughs> this is almost an ironic question for you, but what keeps you up at night? Oh my God, that's hysterical. Uh, <laughs> we ask everybody the same set of questions. And when I got to this one, I was just You're like, like, oh my, oh my God. Yes. yes. Uh-huh. Yes. So, you know, it's interesting. Um, uh, part of the beginning of this whole journey was um, putting out content because like I said, it was solving my own, you know, problem. Um, and so, you know, there were times for me of like, I can't be talking about sleep and have my own sleep issues. Like that is incongruent. And yet one of the things I found is that when I share openly and honestly of like, you know, what? I had a hard time sleeping the other night and I'll put that into a newsletter or whatever people so relate. Cause it's real, mm -hmm. you know, we, especially when you're taking on big things in life, you know, right. they've got, big presentations, you're traveling, you got time zones, you got stuff. There are times that that happens. Um, and so giving, you know, the more I found that I grant myself the grace when I have those times, when I'm overthinking something or what have you, then the sleep comes in mm. such a more reliable way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Who has been your greatest inspiration? Ooh, oh my God. Wow. That is such a good question. Um, you know, uh, my boyfriend will love this one, but I actually have to give it to him because, you know, as a serial entrepreneur, um, you know, the ability to turn lemons into lemonade, you know, kind of taking a problem and making it, you know, something that actually can uh, give a service or, you know, be a service. Um, I've learned so much from him. And he also was the person that was along for the ride with me of during the times I couldn't sleep. And I was just like, ah, pulling my hair out. And mm -hmm. he was just so, so wonderful. So, um, and it's really given me my life in this um, course that I'm on, 
you know, it's, it's really, uh, been a wonderful partnership. So, Oh, that's nice. He is definitely, <laughs> he is definitely getting a feather in his cap. Tonight. Yes, he that's is. He's going to sure. be, he's, he's going to be very happy it. about that one. <laughs> oh, okay. Last but not least, um, God to you is, Ooh, um, God to me is trust. Um, you know, just trust in that there's something bigger, there's something divine actually weirdly gives me cold chills just even talking about that. Um, you know, just it's that there's something beyond our own, you know, kind of silly inner dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, there's something bigger there for us that we don't fully understand. And as much as my obsessiveness wants to know the answer, um, you know, there's, you know, just trusting that. Well, Molly McLaughlin, it has just been an honor talking to you. I hope that this podcast has helped to inspire some of our listeners to really prioritize sleep, because if we don't, we set ourselves up for sickness on so many different levels. And I know you know the feeling of how much different it is when we do get adequate sleep. And I know I know the feeling of how amazing it is when you get adequate sleep. And every single person should have that opportunity to thrive that sleep provides and nothing else can provide it in the same way that sleep can. So if you want to check out and get some behavioral coaching, some technology, as well as force yourself into some accountability, check out Molly's work over at www.sleepisaskill.com. Thanks so much, Molly. Awesome. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. One of the best ways to prevent infection is to keep your defenses up so you are not suddenly caught off guard. Strong immunity is the best way to help you and your loved ones stay healthy. You can do something every day to boost your immune system and give yourself and your family peace of mind. One of those things that you can do every day is drink tea. The benefits of tea have been researched in hundreds of peer-reviewed studies that have been conducted over decades with thousands of years of traditional usage as well. Teas contain diverse immune-boosting ingredients such as polyphenols, catechins, and theoflavins. The more diverse the tea that you drink, the more diverse the immune-supporting ingredients are. I've partnered with Peak Tea to help you get ingredients into your body that support the immune system. Peak Teas are all 100% organic. They are triple toxin screened to ensure that they are free from pesticides, heavy metals, and toxic molds. They're also extracted using a cold brew crystallization technique that preserves active compounds in their maximum potential. The tea is so powerful that it is endorsed by physicians like Dr. Mark Hyman and Dr. Jason Fung. Because it is so simple, it has superb ingredients, and it has a high concentration of ingredients that help to support the immune system. Right now, Peak Tea has an immunity promotion that you can take advantage of. Head to www.peaktea.com slash Lindsay and save up to 15% off of the immunity support blends as well as getting free shipping on all of the immune support bundles. That's www.peaktea.com slash Lindsay. www.peaktea.com p-i-q-u-e-t-e-a dot com slash Lindsay. CBD or cannabidiol is the integrative wellness product of the moment. Everybody wants to get their hands on some CBD and people are using it for a wide variety of reasons. One of the reasons that people are using CBD is to help with sleep. Not gonna lie to you, the data is not great. What we see when people use CBD is that their sleep scores tend to improve in the first month, but they fluctuate over time. And so it's not consistently providing the same sleep for every single person. We also know that THC, the primary active psychoactive component within marijuana plants, is also disruptive for sleep. It may decrease sleep latency, but sleep 
tends to be changed throughout time. So if you're really struggling to sleep, you do want to steer towards a CBD only product versus a product that is combined with THC and CBD. If you want to give CBD a try, I have a special DIY for you. It's a sleep, CBD sleep balm. All you do is melt down about a tablespoon of beeswax, add some jojoba oil to that mix, two tablespoons of coconut oil. So one tablespoon beeswax, one tablespoon jojoba oil, two tablespoons of coconut oil. Melt that down over some gentle heat. Once it's fully melted down, remove it from the stove and add 30 drops of lavender essential oil, 30 drops of cedar wood essential oil, and 200 milligrams of your favorite CBD alone product. Then pop it in the fridge until it hardens up. And when you have got a nice solidified product, you can take it out of the fridge, put it in your bed stand, and just apply a tiny bit of this CBD sleep balm either to the bottoms of your feet with some socks before you go to sleep or simply apply it to the chest. Sweet dreams. The Lindsay Elmore Show is written and produced by me, Lindsay Elmore. Show segments are produced by Sue Procco and Kelsey Lorman. Production design, sound design, and editing is by Jive Media. If you have a question about this or any other episode of the podcast, send us an email to hello at lindsayelmoreshow.com. And hey, since you're still here, take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And while you're at it, go over and follow us on Instagram at lindsayelmoreshow. This helps us bring the pod to more people.